Well, good, good morning. This is this is now the wild show, but it continues really from the previous show because uh, Matthew, shall I say yes. Matthew? Yep. The storyteller is still here. The stand-up philosopher is still here, and I'm I'm going to interview him for the wild show. As if he's just arrived, as if he's a guest on the next show. I could come back through the door if you like. Well, <laughs> we, we had a we had a six minute interval. I'm sure the listeners will understand, because um, I think this is quite a, quite an interesting occasion. The idea of doing philosophy as part of a, a comedy festival. Yeah. Do you think the audience will will um, get what they're expecting? I hope so. I mean, with the stand up show. First of all, some of them is actually funny. I, I do have some comedy philosophy routines, um, about three. Um, so that some of it is genuinely funny. Some of it is moving. Um, and it's what I do in the stand-up show. What I'm going to do with this, this one uh, is um, I'm going to go backwards through time. So I'm going to start with modern problems of freedom and about how hard it is to be in a society where if you're not free to do it, it's either illegal or we worry about it. And whether that means you can be free at all. And then I'm going to go backwards in time, 2,000 years, bit by bit. So we're going to end up with Socrates and then the uh, trial of Socrates, which is one of, the, if you don't know it, it's one of the greatest moments in Western literature. And one of the most moving, because this is a man on trial for his life. And he makes this incredible speech about... Um, about what it is to be alive at all. And it includes all kinds of things like, do you not see people of Athens? <laughs> Truth is beauty. Beauty is knowledge. Knowledge is the good. And he also says, and so let me tell you, people of Athens, how as it has always seemed to me, the unexamined life, it's not worth a living. So you have these really powerful bits, and then at the end he's poisoned, and it, um, and I and, have the and, audience. So, just just to remind you, this is a comedy festival. I know this is a comedy festival, but this is this is this is drama at the end. This is high drama. I have so what you get in um, stand up philosophy is you get you get very funny stories. So I have a really quite a funny storytelling, humory story about. Kant, um, which is actually quite funny. It's Nietzsche's deconstruction of all of philosophy. And we can giggle away and all of philosophy collapses around your ears. And then about an hour later, suddenly it goes terribly tragic. So it's tragic comedy. And one of the things Socrates does in his speech is that he's sending up, um, he's sending up his prosecutors all the way through. So it's both very moving, very sad, uh, but also he is sending up the people who are about to poison him. And one of the games I play with that is I have the audience come in as the people of Athens. So they've got to condemn him. And so you have this game of chess where he's sending up the audience, annoying them, but also saying these very powerful lines. So you say, this is a comedy festival. It is a comedy festival. There are some laughs in stand-up philosophy. But the real, the real thing I love doing with it, the thing you can do in a stand-up show is you can involve the audience in an argument that you, they wouldn't otherwise be involved in and didn't even know that they could get involved in. Oh, right. And that is actually quite similar to comedy because comedy actually works by kind of hooking people into these bizarre stories about some people's life. And so, so heckling is, is welcome. Oh, yeah. Delighted. Um, I, there are certain characters, so for instance... Um, I do a speech by Kant, and Kant has this lovely line, which is from What is the Enlightenment, where he says, Argue as much as you like, but in the end obey, because it is only in obeying you are truly free. Now, if I'm not heckled on that line, I haven't done it right. <laughs> and that line is both incredibly powerful, but also you move the mood music just a little bit. It's also hilarious. <laughs> And I like to put people so that they're not quite sure how they're responding. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so the thing about philosophy, it is both sublime and ludicrous. <laughs> so you say, where does it go? And why is it in a comedy festival? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, in a sense, it's nothing but comedy. But it's something else as well. So I'll give you another example. At the really high moment, when Socrates is about to be led off and given hemlock, he says to his friend, Remember, Crito, to sacrifice a black cock to Aeschylus in memory of my life. Now, on one level, that's terribly sad. 
Yeah. But on another level, what he's actually saying, the Greeks sacrificed black cocks to Aeschylus when they were got better from an illness. So he's actually kind of taking the piss out of the entire thing and saying, you're curing me, you're curing me of life. And that is both very funny and very sad. It's got a comedy element. So if you ask me, does the audience know? Well, I mean, it's in the programme. We don't say, this is high comedy, this is a bundle of laughs. But then I think I'd also come back that most of the best f- f- uh, comedy comedians, the, the Mark Thomases of this world, are moving towards much more meaningful, much less bally laugh f- shows and much more shows that are trying to get to something. So Mark Thomas is doing a show called Bravo Figaro, which is about his relationship with his father as his father is dying. And he has a very troubled relationship. So it's just very moving and very funny. And stand-up philosophy, I'm not nearly as good as that, but I'm playing the same sort of game. I'm being both moving and funny, but putting in ideas and trying to get the audience involved in ideas they didn't know they cared about. OK, and I, th- I think you might have answered my, my next question, actually, which is to do with aura or backstory. Because yes. this, this has come up with other guests that we, we've had. Um, try, trying to make out that art demands uh, a particular place and a, a very direct association with it so that um, sculpture in a gallery has more meaning than oh, okay. a photograph on the web or something like that. Okay. Yes. So it may be that interaction that you're talking about. Yes, Yes, um, it is certainly. I mean, what makes um, the thing is about so many subjects is that we understand them wrong. And one of my other lives, uh, for instance, I'm a maths teacher, believe it or not. Um, and one of the things I think about maths, and one of the ways I teach it, is if you teach maths as it's normally taught, where it's presented as this very formal subject, and you're stupid if you don't learn it. Yeah, um, you kids then think, oh, God, I don't understand math. That means I'm daft. But nobody ever shows them how math doesn't work and how sometimes, for instance, fractions aren't the same as decimals. I know we all tell you they are, but they're not because there's different things. Counting objects is actually a clearly different thing from measuring a length. OK, then actually, when you start to explain that to people and you start to see how and they can start to see how math doesn't quite work and what you have to do to make it work you can get people to understand things they couldn't otherwise understand because you're actually involving them in the in in all the kind of problems that were being solved and one of the things i like doing i like doing when i'm doing a storytelling is to actually involve the audience in the problem (laughs) So, yes, you're creating a situation. You're trying to bring the audience in so that they end up caring and feeling about things that they always thought were either difficult or for somebody else or about somebody else. Because, And philosophy is very much that kind of thing. It tends to get taught in universities and people tend to be reading these books and they're not then really understanding how actually these are ideas that many of them they're thinking about all the time, some of which are quietly oppressing them because they're worrying about it or they're not quite aware that this was a problem Um, and some of it um, they understand without knowing they know it and actually allowing them to do that and to see all of that you can really do that on a performance so you can really get people kind of inspired and thinking and working out how things go in a performance much better than almost... An, you know, I used to lecture. And well, is, is that because you, you can see how much they're appreciating it? You can see how much point. they're appreciating it, but, but it's also that you can get in... There is much more freedom. So my argue as much as you like, but in the end obey, right? If you are not being Kant, that line is appalling. OK, and you will get all kinds of people saying, oh, God almighty, this man actually said that. But if you are being Kant and you're thundering it at an audience, they can see the sense of it. They can see why Kant said it, because it's the context from the argument. And you and, and you're in and I'm in the character of Kant and I've ripped it off from le- notes that were made by his lectures at the time. So you can see it in terms of his overall personality. And that gives you a different angle on it. And you can see how you might agree with it at certain times, because it's not a stupid argument. It's a paradoxical argument, but it's not daffy. And I think performance allows you to do that, because the other thing with performances is is that people will give you more leeway. Because one of the problems we have, one of the problems people have with philosophy, the same with maths actually, is they try to understand it at the wrong moment. It's fatal. You never want to understand everything straight away. You kind of have to let, you have to allow things overwhelm you and then understand them later. So 
people could listen to your your show on on Phonic FM uh, in is it the next two weeks before you actually yes. perform? Yes. And um, that might help them. That will well. What I am doing in my show beforehand is yeah. So for day I was going through how you would perform a piece, um, and I also started. Um, and next week I'm going to do some of the funnies. So I'm going to show. I'm going to do the stand the the slightly more comic elements and show uh, of philosophy and just show people that actually this is funny. I mean, for instance, the funniest I'm doing possibly possibly one of the funniest books ever written. It was by Thomas More Utopia. It's hilarious. It's the Monty Python of its day. So he has, for instance, I'll just give you a line from it. It's possibly the best joke, so I'm giving away my material. This is but only one of them, though.